Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss in this section is Apollo Dionysius Frederick Nietzsche, white feathers and sex in Polynesia. We are going to talk about the Boazians and the Boazian approach, the students of Franz Boaz. We're going to follow that outline right up above my head, and we're going to talk about these guys right around my little yellow box. Franz Boaz's greatest contribution to anthropology wasn't so much that he sort of created this Americanist school of anthropology. It wasn't that he wrote about, you know, uh, the change in bodily size of descent of immigrants. Boaz's greatest contribution were the students he trained, these people who were collectively known as the Boazians, this entire generation of scholars who dominated early 20th century anthropology and who largely revolutionized what we understand as social science and, in a couple of cases, changed the course of American history itself. So Boaz's students, and here they are. These are, these are of course, only some of the Boazians. The Boazians were quite a large group of people, 50, 60, maybe 70 different scholars. This is just a small sample of them. At any rate, uh, the Boazians basically took the Boazian method that Franz Boaz taught them, and they proceeded to go around the world applying it. They would, they would follow the Boazian method. They would intensely study a single culture, document as much of that culture as they could. They would go to the people of that culture and assume that the people were the teachers and they were the students. They would sort of sit at the feet of these people and ask them questions about their culture and then, you know, write down what they were told. And then once they would become an expert in that culture, they would return and then offer large-scale psycho-philosophical interpretations of the culture. They would explain the culture they studied to their own culture, to America, to Britain. And they would do so using these kind of philosophical, you know, psychological models. And this was generally framed in, in Freudian psychology of the day because that was kind of the, the popular sort of, you know, explanatory framework. So a lot of these Boazians, you know, they, they tended to really focus on a lot of Freudian issues. So they're, they talk a lot about sex. They talk a lot about bathroom habits. They talk a lot about, you know, interfamily dynamics. And the Boazians saw it as their duty to kind of scientize, scientize anthropology, to develop this sort of science of human culture. Now, their view of science is slightly different than ours. Their view of science was just observation and documentation by trained observers, not really a formal application of the scientific method. But it doesn't matter. The Boazians did exactly what Franz Boaz trained them to do. They took the Boazian method, they traveled around the world, and they explained all of these various cultures of the world to America. And as a way for America or Europe to solve their own problems. There's Alfred Kroeber there over on the far left. And Alfred Kroeber pretty much documented everything we know about the California Indians. Uh, California had this like really genocidal approach towards its Native American population, one of the harshest approaches uh, in the United States. And pretty much everything we know about the Native Americans of California was recorded by uh, Alfred Kroeber in the early 20th centuries. There's Ashley Montague, who basically pioneered our understanding of culture and gender and the way that those two things interact with one another. There's Ro Robert Lowy, who studied the Great Plains Indians, the Crow, all of these groups, you know, who were transitioning from their sort of pasts in the 19th century to a very difficult 20th century and combining it together into something he called the tree of culture, you know, in, in, in these interpretive explanatory frameworks of human culture. There's Ruth Bunzel, whose ethnographies on uh, Highland Guatemala remain unparalleled documents on the lives of the Native Americans of Central America. There's Edward Sapir, who more or less created, uh, started what we understand of the science of linguistics, arguing how, how the culture affects language and how language can affect culture. But, and then there's, uh, then there's, then there's William Jones. Um, William Jones. William Jones was the first uh, Native American anthropologist. Franz Boas went out and specifically recruited. He wanted a Native American to study anthropology from a Native American perspective. 
And then William Jones wants to study sort of the headhunting tribes of the jungles of the Philippines. So he goes to the Philippines, he meets with the headhunters, and, and uh, they, they kill him and cut off his head. Um, so, I, I mean, anthropology isn't just like studying the Boazian method. It's just not all, you know, sunshine and flowers. Uh, you go to you go to kind of dangerous parts of the world, and and anthropologists bad things do occasionally happen to them. Uh, I mean, Ruth Benedict was involved in this like murder mystery in Arizona in the 1920s, where one of her students was murdered on the uh, Apache Indian Reservation, and uh, they may or may not have like caught the guy that actually did it, who basically spent the rest of his life in prison, and. Uh, Ruth Benedict kind of may or may not have kind of like covered up the murder to not make Columbia University look bad. But that's, that's a whole, that's an entirely different story. My point here is that anthropology is dangerous. You go to sort of odd parts of the world, you go to kind of lawless parts of the world, and you, you do take your chances. I mean, I've been shot at three or four times in Texas, Louisiana, and Guatemala. I've you know, stumbled across some really interesting stuff. I've been arrested. I've been beat up by cops. Uh, we once found a 25-acre patch of marijuana. This was like 1995 uh, in the middle of the Atchafalaya Basin. We walked away from that. Uh, I mean, I've had to administer first aid to a policeman who was shot nine times. Uh, so anthropology has an edge to it. It definitely has an edge to it. But we're not going to talk about Alfred Krober. We're not going to talk about Robert Lowy. We're not going to talk about Edward Sapir. We're mostly going to talk about those two people right up above my head, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead, the most famous of Franz Boas's students. And obviously his students, which were, which were much more famous than, than Franz Boas was. And the Boasians published. The Boasians wrote like crazy. They created this enormous catalog of literature explaining all of the th places they went and the people that they see that they saw they went out they studied at the feet of people from another culture they became experts in those culture and then proceeded to write down everything they learned i mean the, you can always tell when you're reading a book by a boazian because it's like this thick and it's like like eight to nine hundred pages long these like massive books and these, some of these books are classic. Some of these books are incredible. There's Alfred Krober's books on Ishii, the last man, the, the last Yahi Indian, the very last, last member of his tribe, saved by Alfred Krober uh, at uh, Berkeley University. Uh, Ruth Bonzel's monumental work on Chichi Castanango, an incredible book that's like this completely three-dimensional look at like one village in Highland, Guatemala. Ashley Montague's On Being Human, where you're actually looking at how culture affects our self-perception. Edward Sapir's classic works on language. Robert Lowy's big, fat monographs on the Crow Indians and the Native Americans of the Great Plains. And all of these books are accessible. They are all big, thick books. The Boazians saw it as their duty to go and study these cultures, to become experts on these cultures, and then report back what they'd learned to sort of their home nation, to America, to Europe, so that anyone could be able to open, you know, Ruth Bunzel's book on Chichi Castanango and literally kind of surround yourself with the world of this highland Guatemalan village. That's what they did. And then they would sort of take what they'd learned and sort of interpret it, explain it using these very sort of philosophical or psychological models. And a near perfect approach in how this works is Ruth Benedict's book called Patterns of Culture. And in Patterns of Culture, she basically is attempting to answer that big question that Franz Boas posed to his students. Why are the tribes and the nations of the world different? And how can such differences be explained? And this is what she attempts to do in Patterns of Culture. And Patterns of Culture is probably the perfect example of the Boasian method in operation. It's the best example of the Boasian approach. Here is uh, Benedict's basic thesis about culture and her attempt to answer that question, why are the tribes and the nations of the world different? So Benedict starts by basically describing two cultures in great detail. 
uh, sort of the, the Great Plains, Native Americans of the Great Plains, and she contrasts them with the the, uh, the Puebla people of Air, northern Arizona and northern New Mexico, these sort of you know village corn farming uh, Native Americans. And she then offers this sort of psycho-philosophical interpretation of their cultures. Now, basically, she says this. She says, okay, you can sort of analyze a culture based on sort of common attributes. Benedict argues that cultures can act as sort of large-scale versions of the personalities that inhabit them. This is what she calls collective personalities, collective personalities. That basically you take all of the personalities that are possessed by a, a group of people and you can sort of analyze them as if they are one huge personality. You can sort of take that personality and put it on your couch and analyze it like your Dr. Freud. All right, again, this is sort of psychological and philosophical models. Hence, this is how she says we're going to apply psychological models to, to understand their various behaviors and thus answer uh, Franz Boas's original question. Now, what she says is basically this, that, that in all of these collective personalities, they can be divided into one of two categories, Apollonian and Dionysian. There's the god Apollo right over there, and there's the god Dionysius right up above me. The god Apollo is, of course, the god of reason and the god of the intellect. And uh, Benedict says Apollonian cultures. Apollonian cultures are cultures that stress order, uh, calm, restraint, and contemplation. They are rational. They are reserved cultures. They're kind of uptight culture. They think before they act. They repress their emotions. That's what Benedict calls Apollonian cultures. She contrasts this with Dionysian culture. Dionysius is, of course, the god of wine and drunkenness and revelry. And Dionysian cultures, uh, she argues, are based in expression. They're based in freedom, abandonment, uh, impulse. The Dionysian cultures act the way they feel. They don't think about it beforehand. Something arises and they just act. If a crisis comes to the fore, an Apollonian culture will look at the crisis and think about the crisis, contemplate it, and then choose the most sort of rational response. A Dionysian culture would look at the problem and then just act the way they felt. They would act suddenly and em em empathically and passionately, and they would just attempt to solve the problem as quick as they could, you know, as soon as possible. So these are the two types of sort of collective personalities that Ruth Benedict argues about. And then she comes back to, you know, the Native Americans. And she basically says that the Pueblo people of New Mexico and Arizona, you know, these, these corn farmers that live in these large villages, she says, these people are Apollonian. They're very withdrawn. They're very reticent. They're not very emotional. They're very contemplative and they're very rational. They think before they act. And she contrasts this with the Native Americans of the Great Plains, these sort of wild buffalo hunters that were sort of riding horses all the way from, you know, New Mexico and Colorado to Oklahoma and Louisiana. She says those people are Dionysian cultures. They're, they're passionate. They are, act with great, with great emotion. And they do things without thinking. They just act first and think about it later. This is her way of explaining why the tribes and the nations of the world are, in fact, different. But this is not actually her ideas. These ideas that you have Apollonian and Dionysian models, this actually comes from a German philosopher called Friedrich Nietzsche, and that's, that's him right up above me. Friedrich Nietzsche, the bane of, of childhood spelling contests, basically said that the Apollonian and Dionysian impulses are something that is within every person. That these, these psychological concepts derived from the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche, that inside every human we have these two competing impulses. We have our Apollonian side, our rational restrained side, and then we have our Dionysian side, our side of sort of wild, drunken, abandoned. And that, that basically uh, our personalities are formed by the struggle between these two impulses. Uh, one that seeks restraint and order, and the other that seeks freedom and that seeks freedom and abandonment. These are not Benedict's ideas; they are actually Nietzsche's ideas. And she does cite him. I mean, she does not like she's she's masquerading these ideas as her own. 
But ultimately, you know, the sort of, you know, Apollonian and Dionysian impulses, these are actually Freudian in origin, if you go back far enough, this idea that, that our personalities are comprised of, you know, the id and the ego, and then the superego, which, cho which chooses between them. But this is absolutely the perfect way in which these guys were attempting, these Boazians were attempting to answer this question of Franz Boaz. Why are the tribes and the nations of the world different? They're attempting to answer this using philosophical and psychological models, Dionysian versus Apollonian. And this is what Ruth Benedict does in her most famous and influential book, Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which of, of course you're reading for this class. Now in Chrysanthemum and the Sword, she basically looks at Japanese culture. She looks at Japanese culture and she decides that there is a collective personality present in Japanese culture. And then she then proceeds to psychoanalyze this collective personality. Now, uh, of course, the reason she chose to study the Japanese is she was approached uh, during uh, as, during World War II uh, in an attempt that the you know an attempt to explain Japanese culture uh, to you know the the Americans who are proceeding to bomb and destroy Japanese culture, because the Japanese in World War II were acting in ways that were completely different from what we viewed uh, people as acting. You know, prisoners would willingly give up military secrets. The Japanese in the Philippines would horribly abuse, in fact, it was war crimes. They abused uh, American prisoners so badly that a lot of these guys were executed for war crimes. And the Americans could not figure out why the Japanese acted the way they did. They could not figure out why you would have a Japanese force of like, you know, 500 Japanese soldiers. They would be surrounded by 10,000 American and Australian soldiers. You know, an absolutely hopeless position and they'd say, surrender. And the Japanese would attack in these suicidal bonsai charges. The Americans just couldn't understand it. So that was Ruth Benedict's goal, her attempt to explain Japanese culture to Americans. In fact, it, it worked so well. Uh, and earlier versions of this, I mean, the book was published in 1948, but earlier versions of it came out uh, during the Second World War. In fact, it proved so successful, they, they did the same thing. They asked Robert Lowy uh, to study uh, German culture, and he wrote a book called The German People which attempted to do the same thing, even though it, it hasn't really survived, you know, the test of time. At any rate, Ruth Benedict is psychoanalyzing the sort of collective personality of Japanese culture. And eventually she comes down to probably her most famous tool that she uses to analyze cultures, this idea of shame versus guilt cultures. She says, okay, the biggest difference between Japanese culture and Western culture, you know, America and Europe, is a divide between guilt and shame, okay? That she says Japan is ultimately a shame culture, you know, just like, this is just like Apollonian and Dionysian. She says Japan is a shame culture while America is a guilt culture. And both of these uh, shame and guilt cultures have a very different way of putting the individual in contrast to the greater society. And uh, above, the, there's a little chart up above me which explains the big difference between guilt and shame. In a guilt culture, your sense of morality is supposed to come from within. You have a moral code that is kind of imprinted into your personality. And that is supposed to sort of guide you morally throughout your life. And she says shame cultures operate with a very different moral perspective. In shame cultures, the moral perspective, the moral foundation is around you. It is imposed on you by the larger culture. And this is exemplified in the relationship between accusations of criminality, accusations of moral wrongdoing, and the self. Okay, now if you look at the chart right up above, that's a guilt culture. And we have a sort of a, a four-pronged chart based on whether you actually committed some sort of crime and whether other people think you are guilty or not. So if you look at the chart right up above, if you live in a guilt culture and you, ha you have committed the crime, you are guilty, and everyone else thinks you're guilty, then you're guilty and you're punished. There, there's, no, there's no moral conflict. If you are not guilty and everyone else believes that you didn't do it, then there's no problem. And of course, there is no, there is no moral problem. Uh, the, the question comes, 
when you you either did the deed but no one thinks you did it or you didn't do the deed but everybody else thinks you did. If you believe you are not guilty in a guilt culture, if you did not commit the crime, yet the entire world thinks you did, you are expected to voraciously and vigorously fight the larger society. You are expected to protest your innocence and fight the accusation. And we have lots of literature about this, about the individuals who, who do, did no wrong, the man wrongfully accused standing up, you know, and fighting for his right. You know, in fact, some of our most, uh, some of our greatest works of literature are based around that idea. You know, if you've ever had to kill a mockingbird inflicted on you, for instance, that is a totally alien idea in Japanese culture. Now, and then you have the opposite. You are guilty. You did commit the crime, but no one else knows you did it. We expect people who are guilty, but who get away with their crime to be tortured by guilt. We expect that their guilty conscience will continue to torture them, even though they might have gotten away with the crime, even though they have gotten away with murder. You know, because the, the, moral, the moral code is imprinted. It's from the inside. And there's actually a short story that exemplifies this called uh, The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. And if you've read The Telltale Heart or you know the story, then, you know, the, then you know what I'm talking about. But this is how the story goes. It's, it's a story about a man, the narrator of the story, who murders his landlord and he cuts his landlord's body up and he hides the body parts and he ba buries the landlord's heart under the floorboards of his own house. And then later the police come to visit and as the, the police don't actually think our narrator has killed his landlord, but as the police are getting information from him about the landlord and they're, you know, sort of drinking his coffee, the narrator starts to hear the heartbeat underneath the floorboards of his house. And the heart beats louder and it beats louder and it beats louder. And uh, he starts to go mad because he's thinking, how can't the cops understand you know, how, why are they pretending that they can't hear the beating of this heart? And they, they know he did it. They're just torturing him. And, and at the end of the story, he breaks down and confesses to the murder of his landlord to, you know, to stop the incessant beating of that hideous heart. But the thing is, is that the heart was not beating. It was his own guilty conscience torturing him. You can take that story, the telltale heart, tell it to a room full of Japanese people, and they will just look at you completely blank-faced. They won't understand the story. They don't understand why he's being tortured by his guilt. They don't understand why he confesses. Because they, according to Ruth Benedict, they do not live in a guilt culture. According to Ruth Benedict, Japan is a shame culture where the moral code is determined by the people around you. It's not, it doesn't come from inside your brain. It doesn't come from within. So let's do that same rundown with a shame culture. Now, uh, first off, there's the, no, there, there's, there's the no problem solutions. If you are guilty and then everyone else thinks you're guilty, then you're guilty and you're punished, okay? Uh, and th there's no moral problem. Now, if you did not commit the crime and no one thinks you committed the crime, then there's also no problem. There's no moral conflict. However, the moral conflict in our other two cases is very different in Japan, at least according to Ruth Benedict. If you did not commit the crime, if you are not guilty, but everyone else around you thinks you are guilty because the moral code comes from out, it's external, the person is shamed and dishonored by the fact that everyone else thinks he has committed this crime. Whether he did the crime or not is irrelevant. Because you are, you are having the external moral code condemn you, you accept the punishment, whether you committed the crime or not. Also, there is the, the, the other uh, option in which someone, in fact, did commit the crime. You did, you know, commit this horrible moral violation, but no one else thinks you're guilty. And the result is, well, because the moral code is externally imposed, and I, like, killed a dude, but nobody else thinks I killed the dude, there's no problem. No one knows. I'm not shamed. I'm not tortured by my guilty conscience. Okay? Uh, and Ruth Benedict's, this 
dichotomy, Ruth Benedict's idea about guilt and shame cultures, actually does something uh, to explain one of the odd sort of quirks of Japanese culture today, which is that, you know, it's been, it's been about 60 years since World War II, uh, but Japan has like no war guilt for the horrible atrocities they committed during the Second World War. Whereas, you know, guilt from World War II has become part of like Germany's, it's a, it's a central part of Germany's character is, is feeling guilty about World War II. Japanese are not guilty about, about World War II at all, okay? Uh, in fact, this kind of shocks a lot of tourists that they, they go to Japan and they'll go to these Japanese war museums and they look at the war museums and it'll be about World War II and all about like brave soldiers and, you know, faithful sailors going out and serving the emperor, defending Japan. And there's like nary a mention about any of the horrible war crimes, the millions of people that the Empire of Japan killed and sometimes ate. Uh, you know, all of these horrible crimes they committed in World War II. And American tourists are, you know, the most, the most common written thing in these uh, guest books in Japanese museums is remember Pearl Harbor. Uh, because the Japanese, after all, started World War II. They dragged America into World War II. Now, as a historian, coming at this from a historical perspective, uh, this is one of the things that I like to emphasize about some of my students in my history classes, is that we, you know, at least according to the, to the you know, the mechanic set up by Ruth Benedict, we live in a guilt culture today, but to understand 18th or 19th century America, or 18th or 19th century Europe, you have to understand that they are working from a very different moral perspective. They were a shame culture. That the 19th century was a shame culture. It's a culture where the moral code was external to the individual. That around 1900, our own culture changed from a shame culture into the modern guilt culture. And there's in fact a novel that exemplifies sort of this moment of moral transformation. And that is A.E.W. Mason's book that was quite famous at one point in time, his 1902 book, The Four Feathers. Now he didn't write this book to sort of exemplify this sort of grand moral transformation. Uh, he wrote it to write like, like an adventure story about the British Empire in Africa and white feathers. But it, 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 it totally exemplifies this change. It was a novel written right at the cusp of this change. And uh, The Four Feathers, I mean, it's almost completely forgotten today, but it was a very famous novel in its day. It was, it was made into a movie seven times. There are seven different movies made from The Four Feathers. Uh, the most recent one was about, you know, 15 years ago and, and stars Heath Ledger, you know, pre-Joker Heath Ledger. Uh, as the title character, Harry Feversham. And now I'm going to tell you the story of the Four Feathers. And as I tell you the story of the Four Feathers, I want you to think about shame culture. I want you to think about guilt culture and how some characters are operating with one set of moral codes, but the other characters are operating with a very different set of moral codes. And it starts with our main character, and his name is Harry Feversham. And Harry Feversham is an officer in the British Army, okay? He's an officer in the British Army, and he has received word that his regiment is being sent to Central Africa to fight, you know, these wars in Central Africa, to fight the Mad Mahdi, you know, in, a, in an attempt to rescue this trapped uh, British Army led by a guy called General Gordon. That, that doesn't matter. What matters is that the British Army is headed to Central Africa. And Harry Feversham goes has this moment of profound moral crisis. He goes, look, I don't think this is really right. I don't think this is morally good to be invading, you know, Central Africa. We shouldn't be doing this. The people in Central Africa, they're just defending their home. They're just defending their faith. You know, and we're invading for this idea of empire and this idea that they have somehow insulted the honor of the British Empire and they've shamed the British Empire. It's like, we should not be invading Central Africa. And, and he has this moral conundrum. And he has, you know, three friends. And they're, they're Trench, uh, Castleton, and Willoughby. And they are his sort of fellow officers in this British regiment. And there is, of course, his beautiful fiancée, Ethany. Not Bethany, Ethany. At any rate, so Trench and his, his good friend, Captain Trench, 
And Captain Trench comes to him and says, uh, look, I understand you have some moral problems, but look, uh, these rebels, this army, these, these, these rebels down in Central Africa, they've insulted the British Empire. They've killed General Gordon. We have to avenge the empire. It is the sake, the, the, the honor of the empire is at stake. We'll be shamed if we do not do this. And, and, and Harry is like, I, I don't think this is a good idea. In fact, my guilty conscience will not let me make war on these poor people in Central Africa. I'm not going to do it. In fact, I'm going to resign my commission. And Captain Trench goes, oh, you're, you can't do this. You know, the regiment depends on you. You're a good officer. And I can't believe you're going to resign your commission. This is a mark. This is the mark of a coward. And Harry goes, that's absolutely mad. I'm, you know me. You know, we've fought in, in half a dozen wars across the world. I'm no coward. But I, I, can't, I can't go on this imperial adventure to Central Africa. And Captain Trench goes, uh, you know, the, the novel goes on, and eventually Captain Trench goes, I can't believe you resigned your commission. I can't believe you've quit the army. I can't believe you are letting the honor of your regiment down. And uh, Trench goes, uh, I'm sorry, Harry, but I can no longer be your friend. And in fact, Captain Trench turns to Harry and gives him the mark of ultimate cowardice a single white feather. And this is this is the sort of Victorian mark of a total coward. You only give like the worst people, people that have fundamentally betrayed you, a white feather. So Captain Trench gives Harry a white feather. And Harry is beside himself. He can't believe this. His best friend has literally called him a coward in public, given him this white feather. And he, he goes off and his mind is reeling and he eventually bumps into Castleton and Willoughby and they're sitting in a pub in London and Castleton and Willoughby are, and one of them is like kind of a more nebbishy guy with glasses and the other guy is like a more like burly rugby player. I think that's, I think that's Castleton and Willoughby respectively, but I, I don't remember correctly. It might be confusing it with the Heath Ledger movie. It's a really good movie. At any rate, Castleton and Willoughby are like, we heard this story from Captain Trench that you've resign the commission because you have a, like a guilty conscience? And Harry is like, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to go make war on these poor people in Africa. That's silly. I'm not going to do that. And Castleton and Willoughby are like, we can't believe you're going to let us down. We can't believe the, the honor of the empire is at stake. You are bringing shame to our regiment. You cannot do this. Look, go to the general. You're, you're like, you're dating. You're about to marry his daughter, Ethany. Go to the old general. He can pull strings. He can get you back in the commission right before our regiment ships out for Africa. And uh, Harry's like, no, my conscience wouldn't, won't let me do this. So Castleton and Willoughby look at each other and they're like, yeah, we thought this might happen. Captain Trench told us about this. So they turn to Harry and each of them gives him a white feather. All of his friends are publicly admonishing him as a complete coward. And Harry is, Harry's mind is just completely blown. And he's just absolutely reeling. And his regiment ships out in Trench and Castleton and Willoughby all go off, you know, to fight in Africa. And, and Harry just can't believe this, that his three best friends in the world gave him white feathers. And he, he just can't believe what's going on. And he goes to the old general's house to his fiancee, Ethany. I have to say it because otherwise I'll, I'll call her Bethany. And she's Ethany. So he goes to Ethany and he's like, I can't believe this. My, my three best friends, uh, you know, just called me a coward. They each gave me white feathers. You know, at least I've got you, Ethany. I've got you in my corner. And Ethany turns around and she hasn't said a word this entire time. She turns around and hands Harry a fourth white feather. He is completely socially ruined. Everyone has rejected him. He is a complete and total coward. And he basically spends the next few months drinking. He can't believe what's going on. He can't believe this happened. And then he hears about this disaster in Africa, that the, the regiment that his friends are in and the British army has, has lost a battle and it's been absolutely smashed and his friends are considered, they're, they're either dead or lost or captured and then they will be tortured and mutilated and executed in the heart of Central Africa. And, and then Harry conceives a plan and he's like, <laughs> 
I have to go rescue my friends in Africa. And that's the entire rest of the book. It takes place over six years as Harry basically gives away everything he has, sells every piece of property and every bit of wealth he possesses, and he spends it all one by one rescuing his friends from like prisons in the heart of Africa. And one of them has been blinded, has got his eyes cut out. And one of them is a slave in a salt mine. I think it's a salt mine. At any rate, as he rescues his friends one by one uh, from Africa over the next six years, they basically ask for their feathers back. They're like, look, we were wrong about you, Harry. You're not a coward. Uh, even though I've got no eyes, I, even I can see that. So he rescues his friends one by one. And he, oh, once all of his friends have been rescued, and he's like all messed up at the end of the book. He's got like, he's got like, a, he's got a bunch of fingers chopped off at one point and his leg is all twisted and broken. And he's all like horribly scarred and he has like no money and the army won't take him back. And at the end of the book, he basically goes to Ethany and he says, look, um, I know you're now engaged to another man. Um, and I have no money. I have nothing to offer you, but I want you to take back your white feather. And she does. Okay. And that's, the entire novel of the four, I've spoiled the movie for you. That's the entire, that's the entire narrative of the four feathers. It's a person who loses, incurs great shame, and then he has to earn back his honor. But you see, everyone else around him is, is, is operating with one moral code, but his, his moral code is completely different. And that's what I think Mason captured in this novel in 1902. One of the reasons that it's it's been continually in print for you know for 120 years and it's had seven movies made of it that it that it sort of hits this fund it was written at this time of fundamental moral transformation. Now, that's Ruth Benedict. We are going to move on to probably uh, Franz Boas's most famous student. In fact, arguably the most famous anthropologist ever. Margaret Mead. I mean, she was on a stamp. Margaret Mead, 1901 to 1978, uh, is probably the most famous, most influential anthropologist in the history of cultural anthropology. And she wrote her first book, which is her most famous, most influential, and most widely read book, Coming of Age in Samoa. And I want to talk about Coming of Age in Samoa, how it is this sort of nearly perfect Boazian approach to study and culture. You, you go to a culture, you sit at the feet of the people who live in the culture, they are the teachers and you are the student, you learn from them, and then you offer up psychological and philosophical interpretations kind of of the collective personality of that culture. I mean, the subtitle of Coming of Age in Samoa is a psychological study of primitive youth for Western civilization. It is a perfect Boazian way to study culture. Now, oh, there's young uh, Margaret Mead right there. Again, one of the more famous and influential works of the students of Franz Boaz was Coming of Age in Samoa, published 1928 by Margaret Mead. And it is a psychological study of primitive youth for Western civilization. Now, Margaret Mead, she was only 23 years old, in 1925 and 1926, she actually travels to American Samoa, which was a colony that America had in the Central Pacific. And it was an area that was selected by Franz Boas. Uh, Margaret Mead goes to Franz Boas and she says, "I, you know, I want to study. And Franz Boas and her sort of work it out. And they think a really good place for her to work would be American Samoa. Uh, and she eventually ends up on this island of Taua. I'm mispronouncing that, but I'm, I'm doing my best. Taua, which is a small island that has less than uh, 600 people on it. And there she begins to basically execute a perfect Boazian way to study human culture. And there she is on Taua. So Margaret Mead goes to study uh, Taua, and she goes as a student to learn from her teachers, which she decides are going to be the young girls and adolescents of this uh, Samoan island. So she focuses on the young girls and adolescents there, and she eventually arrives at the conclusion that Samoan adolescents are largely free from the stresses and anxieties 
of sort of adolescence in America or adolescence in the United States. And she says that the people of Samoa are free of these psychological hangups and that they don't have a lot of stress uh, for in adulthood because they grow up in a sexually liberated society. This is the result of their uninhibited sexuality uh, during adolescence. Now, uh, young Samoan girls, according to Margaret Mead, freely take and leave lovers as they will. They come of age as teenagers and are encouraged to sexually experiment with the people their age. And basically, as long as they keep it discreet and as long as nobody give, gets pregnant, they are encouraged to sexually experiment with the teenagers around them. They make and take lovers. They don't even seem to be restricted to gender. Some of their lovers are, are uh, of the same gender. Some of their lovers are of opposite gender. And they engage in this sort of sexual experimentation from the time they're young teenagers up until the time they get married. So Samoan teenagers are not are sexually liberated people. Uh, they're not monogamous. They're not even, you know, overly heterosexual. And because they're sort of encouraged uh, to experiment sexually, they become psychologically healthy adults. They're not repressed. They're not, they don't have all these psychological pressures when they don't have all these hang-ups and psychological fetishes and sexual fetishes that people in the West do. They are psychologically healthy because they have a sexually liberated adolescence. And this is absolutely classic Freudian psychoanalysis. And this was one of the points that Sigmund Freud made in the 19th century, that, that, psych, that neuroses and psychoses of adults, uh, of adults come from sexual repression when you're young. So Margaret Mead turns that on its head, that because sexual activity and sexual experimentation is normal and natural, because the Samoans because the Samoans engage in such uh, sexually liberated behavior, they don't grow up to have a lot of neuroses and psychoses as adults. Uh, sexual repression, especially during adolescence, causes psychological damage in adulthood. That's Sigmund Freud. So Margaret Mead seems to have found a human culture that confirms Freud's ideas about sexuality and psychoses, about sex and sexual repression. And again, this is a perfect example of Boazian anthropology. It focuses on a single culture, in fact, focuses on a single issue within that culture, which is Samoan adolescence. It offers, it studies one issue intensively, and then it offers this sort of psychological interpretation of that issue, of that cultural practices, and then it offers solutions for her own society. It takes these solutions that she found in Samoa and carries them over to American culture. That's exactly what they were supposed to do. And in Margaret Mead's case, it was that the Samoans represented this sort of enlightened sexuality, free from sexual repression and free from the hangups common in the West, common in American culture. Hence, adolescent angst is not universal. And to reduce adolescent angst and to reduce and produce more psychologically healthy adults, according to Margaret Mead, the West and America should embrace sexual liberation and should embrace the type of enlightened sexuality that she documented in Samoa. And this is, this is her prescription to fix problems in America. And even though uh, A Coming of Age in Samoa was published in 1928, it went on to become one of the most widely read books in America. And it became one of these few books that changes American culture, not for one generation, but for the next. Coming of Age in Samoa went on to become one of the most famous texts ever written in anthropology, and it served as a foundational cornerstone to the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, when Betty Friedan uh, writes her 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique, and sort of launches second wave feminism, Betty Friedan cites uh, coming, of age, coming of Age in Samoa extensively and basically says that Margaret Mead was one of the people that compelled her to write The Feminine Mystique. And Coming of Age in Samoa became one of the most influential books in American history. 
without coming of age in Samoa, you probably would not have had the sort of free love movement, the hippies, <laughs> the naked hippies, and the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. It was one of the books that permanently changed American culture. And yet, and yet, the whole thing might have been a lie. Margaret Mead might have faked everything she wrote about in Coming of Age in Samoa. And we'll discuss that next time. And I will see you there.